Sunday mornings and in Sunday school, we're focusing in on the Christmas story, but on Wednesday nights, we're still focusing in on the book of Romans. And uh, this week, we're going to finish Romans chapter 12, and we're going to find uh, a common theme throughout much of the end of this chapter. And in fact, we mentioned, uh, we, we looked at this theme a little bit last week as well. Uh, let's begin uh, just for a little bit of review. Uh, look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God doesn't want us conformed to the world. He wants us transformed. He wants us transformed by the renewing of our minds. How do we renew our minds? We get into the Word of God. Uh, we're surrounded all week long by the influences of the world, and we need to be baptized in the Word of God. We need to have uh, be immersed in the Word of God uh, through church, through personal devotions, uh, through witnessing. We need to be surrounded by the Word of God so that our minds will be transformed. Uh, then, down in verse 3, he says, I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And then he describes how that in the church body there are many members, and those many members are different from one another. And what he, what he emphasizes in this passage is that we should learn to value the differences of other church members, the strengths of other church members. Every one of us believe that the job we're doing for Christ is important, or we should, and we're right. Our job for Christ, whatever job we have, whatever jobs we have, is extremely important. But just as important as our jobs are, each other believer in the body of Christ, their job is just as important. In fact, the Scripture makes it clear. Sometimes uh, those parts of the body that, that we, don't, we don't pay attention to much, uh, they become very obvious that we need them when we're missing them. Uh, just imagine if you woke up one morning and, and one hand or one arm was gone. I mean, imagine how your day would go. Uh, try, living, try living one day just without your thumb. I mean, just tape your thumb down to your hand and see how everything goes that day. The smallest members, the, the seemingly insignificant members are so important in the work of the body of Christ. The bottom line is there are no insignificant members. There are no insignificant tasks for Jesus Christ. Every task is of a great importance. Every task is to further the kingdom for Jesus Christ. That's why the Lord says, if you give a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, you won't lose your reward. Now that tells me that Jesus sees every task in his kingdom as being an important task to help further the gospel. And so we looked at the different gifts and how that all those gifts are so important, but that we also must operate in love. If we don't operate in Christ's love, then those gifts are null and void. So we should exercise our gifts. We should work on the gifts that we're not as good at naturally. And we should operate all of those gifts in love. Then last week we began in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Be sincere with your love. Don't be a phony. Don't be a fake. Be sincere. Be real. Uh, be real with your Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 9, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Uh, as I said last week, if you had a twin and you're saved and your twin is lost and you're sitting there with your twin and you have a brother who's a brother in Christ, let's say from Africa, you actually have more in common with the brother in Christ from Africa than you do your very twin brother. Why is that? Because when you have come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were born into God's family. And so it's so important that we treat one another with that kind of love. We're, we're part of the same family. Uh, I love that song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And we are. We're a church family. We're a family of the Lord. Uh, verse uh, 10, it says, In honor, preferring one another. Verse 11, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. There should be an urgency about what we do. Verse 12, Rejoicing in hope. Again, hope for a Christian doesn't mean we hope things will work out. It means we have an ex expectation that God is going to fulfill His promises. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Our reflex, our natural reflex, 
when trouble comes, shouldn't be complaining. It shouldn't be bitterness. It shouldn't be anger. It should be prayer. It should be immediately going to God in prayer about everything. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. The Bible says, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. The Lord said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Prayer is so important. Uh, pray, prayer is that, is that uh, connection between us and heaven, but it helps us through difficult times to meet with the Lord. Uh, one old-time preacher used to say, if you feel like quitting on God, go to God and tell Him you're going to quit and you'll never quit. And that's absolutely right. It's absolutely right. God will lift your burdens. God will help you. Verse 13, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Uh, if we see a need and we're able to meet it, we ought to meet the need. Verse 14, bless them. And this is where we spent a lot of time last week and where much of the rest of our time this week will be as well. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Verse 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice. And weep with them that weep. Uh, around Christmas time, th there's, a, again, a great dichotomy. We have families weeping this time of year. A lot of families weeping. We have families who, this is their first Christmas without a specific loved one. Uh, there's families that have loved ones on deathbeds right now. And yet, at the same time, we have the festivities and the rejoicing of the season. As a Christian, we must be willing to do both. We must be willing to rejoice with those who rejoice to weep with those who weep, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, verse 16, the Bible says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Let's pray and we'll start here. Lord, I pray that you'll fill me with your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person here tonight. Lord, open our hearts to receive your word. Help us, Lord, to learn some things, but to obey, above all, to obey the things you show us tonight. Lord, encourage, strengthen whatever we need. Please give it to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice it says, Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Uh, look back in verse 3 again. He says, For I say through the grace given unto you, unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Whatever we have, we've received it from the Lord. Now, I don't just mean physical possessions. I mean knowledge. I mean health. I mean uh, uh, a background and family. Whatever we have was given to us by God. And so the Bible says in verse 16, in our words, what we would say is get off your high horse. Don't live your life in such a way that there are people you couldn't talk to because you're above them. Folks, we're not above anybody. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We are all just sinners saved by grace. We ought to be able to talk to the lowly bus kid, the lowly bus kid, and we ought to be, talk to, be able to talk to the highfalutin, important, uh, wealthy people. You know what? We're all just people. At the end of the day, we're going to all stand before God, and we're either saved or lost. And so the Scripture says here, be of the same mind one toward another. Don't show favoritism toward one group versus another group. Don't, don't be cliquish. We, we were talking about this the other day. As a church, don't be cliquish. And I, I don't think we are, and I praise the Lord for that. But we don't ever want to get to that either. Uh, th we ought not to have uh, a clique in a church. Why? Because we are God's family. And so we're to be of the same mind one toward another. Remember in the book of James, one of their sins was the sin of partiality. What did they do? They, they would see a man come in in poor clothing, and they'd say to him, Oh, you go sit somewhere way out there. We, we don't, you're not very important. But another man would come in wearing really nice clothes and having a gold ring, and they'd say, Oh, you, they, he'd come into church, into the assembly, and they'd say, Hey, hey, Mr. Deep Pockets, Mr. Fat Wallet, you sit in the honored spot. And James said, You've become partial and you've become evil in your thoughts. We're not to uh, favor one above the other. We're, we're to recognize that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're to have the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend the men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Let's look at a couple of passages. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, please. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 7. Proverbs 3, verse 7. By the way, as a teacher, as a preacher, or just in general... A sign of great education isn't to talk above 
somebody's head and confuse them. That's not the sign of great education. The, the, sign, the sign of really learning a truth God has given you is that you can take it, and you've heard this said, and you can put, it on the, put the jelly on the bottom shelf so everybody can get it. You know, the, a child should be able to understand the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, we, we should realize that uh, God made it simple for us. Think about this for a minute. If anybody had an amazing high IQ and amazing intelligence, who would it be? Jesus Christ. How did Jesus Christ teach? He taught with parables. He took truths and he, I, I mean, he could have impressed us, right? If anybody knew vocabulary and if anybody knew everything, it was him. But what did he do? He said there was a, a, a man who had a hundred sheep and he lost one of them. There was a lady who had ten coins and she lost one. There was a dad who had two sons and he lost one. That's how Jesus taught. And, and we're to learn from that. Uh, again, not just in teaching or preaching, but we should realize, again, the ground's level at the foot of the cross. Look at Proverbs 3 and look at verse 5. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Now look at 1 Corinthians for a moment, please. 1 Corinthians, look at chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll come back here quickly to Romans 12. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. This chapter is referring to what we would call questionable things, things that Christians might debate, uh, things that Christians might have disagreements about whether they're right or wrong. And in this particular case, it had to do with meat that was offered to idols. Uh, th there were places called the shambles, basically the shambles. I know it sounds interesting, but basically what they were, they were open markets where they would sell meat and other types of things. And what would happen is they would take the meat that they had offered to idols, they had presented it to fake gods, to, to idols, and they would offer it there in their pagan god or their, or their pagan temple, their pagan shrine. Then they would take that meat and they'd sell it on the open market and turn a profit. Well, Paul himself, he said, I don't personally have a problem with buying that meat. He said, because regardless of what they did to the meat, regardless of who they offered to it, I know who really provided it. God did. I know that God created it. He said, but listen, just because I know that, there are some people that this would offend their conscience to eat this meat. Now, that's the background of what he's going to say now. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. He says, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. You know, all of us know something, right? We all know something about different uh, subjects, different topics. We all have our opinions. We all have uh, our, our background. We all are coming from a different place sometimes. We all have knowledge. Now, but notice what it says next. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Knowledge puffs up. It makes us feel bigger than we should. It puts us on a high horse. It says, well, everybody else can just be wrong, and I know I'm right. You know, It's like the guy says, I... I, I, I was only wrong one time in my life, and that was when I thought I was wrong. You know, that, that's, that's what sometimes we think. Hey, oh, I'm, I'm right. I mean, it's my opinion. I must be right. The fact is we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but notice charity edifieth. What does that mean? It means charity builds up. So it, this shouldn't be a competition of who knows more, who's right, who's wrong. It should be a matter of do we love one another to build one another into the image of Jesus Christ? Uh, all of us have knowledge. All of us could look at other people's lives and say, well, they should improve in this and this and this. And really what we should be doing the whole time is first looking at ourselves and saying, boy, I should improve in this and this and this. And when dealing with other people, our approach should be love. Our approach should be helping them to grow into the image of Jesus Christ. If anybody needs to be fixed, it ought to be us first. We've got to draw a circle around ourselves and say, It's me, it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And then show love to others. Verse 2, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. Boy, it's going to be an amazing thing when we get to heaven and we realize there's a whole lot we didn't know. 
It's kind of like uh, teenagers, you know, how, how smart their parents get the older they get, right? No, the parents aren't getting smarter. The teens are getting wiser. Uh, when, when, when teens are growing up, they think the parents don't know much. And then as they get older, they realize mom and dad really knew a whole lot. Verse 3, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. The Bible says that, that the two greatest commandments are to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. If you take care of those two things, you worry about those two things, all the other things fall into place. All the other things do. Let's go back to Romans 12. Look what it says in verse uh, verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Look at verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible... As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Look at that again, 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Let's turn back to Matthew 5. We looked at this last week. Matthew chapter 5 again. Matthew 5, look at verse 38. Jesus says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. Now, when that comes to government, by the way, let me say this. That's absolutely what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture teaches when it comes to government, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Let me also say this. The Scripture does not say my family's eye for an eye and my family's tooth for a tooth. What I'm saying is this. God is not teaching to be a pacifist. God is not teaching that you don't protect and defend your family. No, as a matter of fact, you have a responsibility to protect and defend your family. But what he is saying is this, if somebody is putting a personal attack on you, I mean on you specifically, notice what he says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. That verse is rooted in the history of what the Roman soldiers were allowed to do. They were mile markers, much like we have on our highways. We have mile markers. And a Roman soldier could go to anybody. And they could say, you, carry my stuff. Carry my backpack. Carry my stuff right now. And by law, you had to carry it one mile. You had to stop what you were doing. Didn't matter how busy you were. And you had to carry that Roman soldier stuff, one mile. Now listen, read this verse again. Realize what Jesus is saying. Notice what he says, verse 41. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. We've heard of going the second mile. This is the verse it came from right here. He's saying, listen, if, a, if one of those soldiers comes to you and says, you take my, you take my stuff because you have to. He said, then you take it a mile, then take it another mile. You know what you're going to do? You're going to have that soldier scratching his head going, huh? Nobody's ever done that before. Usually what they would do is they'd take the stuff and they'd throw it down, they'd spit on it and walk away. But Jesus said, no, whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. It's what my dad used to say in his language. He'd say, Tim, it's better for you to be getting run over. This is how he would say it. It's better for you to be getting run over than to be running other people over. You know, what, what we forget is that the day is going to come we're all going to stand before God. We're all going to stand before God. And we're all given an account for our lives. Notice what it says. Then he says, verse 42, Give to him that asketh thee. From him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Again, rain being a blessing, not, not a bad thing, rain being something good. He sends it to just people, he sends it to unjust people. Verse 46. You say, well, what's, the, what's the incentive here? I mean, we, should we just be doormats and let everybody walk over us? I mean, what, what's the incentive? Well, the incentive here is that he says, listen, you'll be like your father. The incentive is to become more like Christ. But it goes even deeper than that. 
Now we can say, and I, I believe this, I believe that folks who serve the Lord, we would do it without reward. I, I believe that. I believe because we love the Lord, we want to serve Him. But there's a reason God mentions rewards in the Bible. He mentions it so often that we should take notice. Notice what He says. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same, the publicans being the tax collectors. Verse 47, And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, listen, uh, you go ahead and you die to self. Die to self. There's great reward in serving the Lord. There's great reward in in treating your enemies the way God would treat them. Look what the Bible says. Let's continue. We'll go back to a couple passages here. Go back to Romans 12, verse 17 again. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Notice verse 18. Again, sometimes it's not possible. God's not saying be a pacifist. You should protect your country, and you should protect your family, and a government has a responsibility to protect its citizens. That's biblical. But now look at verse 18. If it be possible, that means sometimes it's not. But if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. What is God saying? He's saying you ought to do your absolute best to live peaceably with everybody. That's what he's saying. You ought to do your absolute best to get along with everybody. Now, does that mean you're going to get along with everybody? No. Because sometimes it's not possible. Some people just want to, uh, want to cause trouble. And in that case, you can't live peaceably with them. But as much as lieth in you, that means in, instead of as much as lieth in me, look for a fight. No, he says as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, here's his promise. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. What that means is this. Don't take matters into your own hands. You sub, you commit this matter to God's hands. Can I remind us of something? God does a whole lot better job with our enemies than we do. A whole lot better job. Think of David just for a minute. Think of David. David was loyal to Saul. David was his most loyal subject. He was a son-in-law, he was family, but he was a loyal soldier. He was a loyal general. And how did Saul repay him? Saul repaid him by trying to kill him over and over and over and over again. Now, David had a couple of opportunities, didn't he? Remember in the cave when uh, Saul was covering his feet, the Bible says? And what did David do? He snuck up behind him. He cut off the bottom of his robe. And as Saul was leaving the cave, he showed him the robe. He said, listen, I could have killed you. Remember the time Saul was asleep and his mighty men were all around him? And God caused a deep sleep to fall on them. And David went down and they took his bolster and his uh, cruise of water. They took the spear and he got a long ways away and he, he lifted them up and showed Saul. He could have taken matters into his own hands. But here's what David realized. David realized that he, David, was in God's hand. And when, God, when you're in God's hand, God can fight your battles for you. God can take care of some of those things. Notice what he says. Rather, give place unto wrath. Turn this thing over to God. If there's somebody who's doing you wrong, turn them over to God. Turn them over to God. He'll do a much better job than you will. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Look out when God repays. That's in Deuteronomy 32, 25. Verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Uh, I've heard a lot of theories about what that means. Last, and I really have. I've heard a lot of stories. People have taken that and twisted it to say all kinds of things. Last I knew, it wasn't good to take coals of fire and put them on anybody's head. That's the last thing I knew. Uh, last I knew, I've never seen people take hot coals and rest them on their head. Folks, what happens What happens when somebody, somebody is trying to do you wrong, they're trying to make you mad, they're trying to upset you, they're trying to get you to lose your Christian testimony? 
What happens when you respond in a Christ-like manner? What does that do to that person? You know what it does many times? It makes them angry. Why? Because they want to be upset. They want to stay mad at you. Uh, let, me, let me say it like this. I remember when we played basketball, our, our, my, my pastor, he was our youth pastor and became our pastor, and he would tell us this. He'd say, guys, he'd say, listen, if you're playing ball and a guy throws an elbow and hits you in the face, or he shoves you down, or he fouls you hard, he said, here's what I want you to do every time. He said, they knock you to the ground, you get up, you turn and you smile at them and run up the court. Can I tell you what happened every time you smiled at the guy who just knocked you down? Oh, you know why? Because they're looking for a response. They're looking for a reaction. They want you to take the same path they took. The Lord says, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Don't give him back the same stuff he's given to you. If he thirsts, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now, keep your finger here and look at Proverbs 25 a minute. There's another line added to that. Look at Proverbs 25, verse 21. Now, we, we either believe the Bible or we don't. We either believe this is what we're supposed to do or we don't. I know this isn't easy stuff. I know it's not. But I also know that God's right. Look at Proverbs 25, verse 21. Notice what it says. If thine enemy... Be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Don't miss this. This is so important to understand. And the Lord shall reward thee. Who's God going to reward if you take care, if, if you don't respond in kind to your enemies? He's going to reward you. You know, the Bible even says this. It says, take heed in thine heart. Listen, this is so important. Take heed in thine heart. If your enemy falls, it says, don't rejoice. You know what we learn by this? We learn that God is more interested in the heart of his children than he is in us avenging ourselves when we've been wronged. He's more interested in us having the proper response. If thine enemy hunger... Feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Look at verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about bitterness. You know, if you're bitter, you've been overcome with evil. If you're discouraged, despondent, uh, you, you've quit something you shouldn't be quitting you, 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 because of somebody doing something wrong to you, you've been overcome with evil. If, you're, if you can't go to bed at night without that person coming to mind and you just being furious and angry, you've been overcome of evil. If there's anybody that distracts you from your walk with Christ simply because of things they've done to you, you've been overcome of evil. Bitterness is like rioting in your own neighborhood. Bitterness keeps you in bondage. And when, when you learn to forgive, when you learn to just say, you know what, God, I'm in your hands. Lord, I, I'm so mad at this person. But God, you know what, I'm in your hands. So God, I give it to you again. Remember what that word forgive means. It means to, to, it means to send away. Just like you go out to that lake and you pick up that stick. And you throw it out in the lake. Eventually what happens? It works its way back. So I, I can't forget. No, you probably can't forget. We don't have that, that capacity. But you know what we can do? We can forgive. How many times? Every time it comes back. Every time it comes back, pick that stick up, throw it out again, say, God, I forgive again. By the way, haven't we all needed forgiveness? Yes, we have. Be not overcome of evil. What does he say? But overcome evil with good. I'll be done with this. The Bible says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that's broken down and without walls. Think of that picture for a minute. We have defense systems now. We have, we have satellites and jets and all kinds of missiles and things. But think back, way back when, what, were their, what was their major defense? Walls around the city. And if they didn't have walls around the city, they were at the mercy of their enemies. Their enemies got to decide what kind of day they had. 
The Bible says, he that hath no rule over his own spirit. It's like a city that's broken down without walls. What that means is, if I don't control my attitude, I don't control the way I think about things, I'm at the mercy of my enemies. I had a, had a boy this week on the bus. He, he got upset. And uh, I saw him crying on the bus. And I, I, I called him up. I said, what's wrong? He said, there's a kid bullying me at school. And I said, oh, what, what's going on at school? And the boy, he's got a haircut. All his hair's gone. Buzzed off. He said, the kid at school's bugging me, calling me baldy and all this and that, you know. I said, well, you know what? I said, it's a funny thing. I said, yeah, it, he shouldn't be doing that. I, I get that. I said, but, you know, it, it's an amazing thing. I'll bet if the next time he says that, if you just don't care, you just act like you don't care because you might still a little bit, but the next two or three times you just it doesn't bother you, I'll bet he'll stop. Rule your own spirit. Don't let somebody who's wronged you rule your spirit. Don't let somebody who's wronged you determine what kind of life you're going to have. No, be not overcome of evil. Overcome evil with good. Let's bow our heads together. For a Hi, everybody. This is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, but we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.